Let's turn to Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. And as I have been doing for the last few weeks, I will not read any passage, but if you ask me what my passage is, I would say it's, it's all the suffering of Jesus. It's all his sufferings on the cross. So if you want a verse number, you can take it as verse 15 to 32, but really that's not enough to capture his entire suffering. We've been talking about the sufferings of Jesus on the cross, and last week I ended by saying that um, the greater purpose of Jesus' suffering on the cross is not just so that our sins might be forgiven and we might go to heaven when we die, although that is precious, that's priceless, that's glorious. <laughs> but we saw last week how in light of God's kingdom plan, the reason Jesus died on the cross for us is so that he might bring in the kingdom. How? By making us kings under him so that he may rule the world through us. You remember we, we saw all this last time. Basically, God's plan from the beginning was to rule the earth through his people. To rule the earth through his people. That's why he made man in his image and likeness and told them to rule, subdue and have dominion. Man lost that and in and through what Jesus did, God again brings us to that state, makes us once again to have dominion and to subdue and to be like a ruler basically so that he might rule us and we might rule the earth. That's God's plan. So in other words, God's plan is to make us like a king. Now the moment I say that, it's very easy to understand that in a worldly sense, to make us like a king can be understood in various ways. If a person has a worldly mindset, all they'll think is, well, who's a king in the world? You know, yeah, we don't have literal kings today, but we have the great ones, so to speak, you know, the powerful ones. And what do we think of when we think of them? We think of power, we think of wealth, we think of um, position, we think of influence, we think of fame. That's what they have. And so if you just think in a worldly way, when you hear, okay, God wants to make me like a king, you know, well, you, all you think is power, wealth, and fame, and reputation. The list I just gave you, right? But that's exactly why we should not think like that. The definition of a king is Jesus. Jesus defines who a king is. Jesus defines who a man is, who a human being is. Jesus defines who God is. And Jesus also defines what greatness is. Greatness is not defined by the world. Greatness is not to be understood by looking at the great ones of the world and deciding, oh, this is what greatness is all about. No, you look at Jesus and you realize what greatness is about. You look at Jesus and he's got all those things. It's not that he doesn't have power. <laughs> he's got more power than anybody else in the world. It's not that he doesn't have wealth or a position or fame or influence. He's got all that, but he's got some other things as well. He's a very different kind of king. And you see certain qualities, especially as he goes to the cross. You see many qualities that are unique about him. He's got, you know, the kings of the world don't have power over sin. They may have power over great kingdom, but they don't have power over their own, you know, hearts, desires. You know what I mean? But Jesus has power over sin. He lives a sinless life. Jesus has power over the devil. He drives out the demons. Jesus has power over sickness. Jesus, you know, words have power and so on. So he displays the kind of power he has. It's a very different kind of power than just what you see out in the world. But then as he goes to the cross, you see some things that you don't normally see in so-called kings. As he goes to the cross, you see extreme humility on display. He's willing to go down so low to help people like us, save us and so on. You see extreme service. To serve people is one thing, but to serve by going and dying on the cross, <laughs> giving your life is another level. You, know? you see extreme sacrifice. You see extreme love. That's what a king is. A truly great one has extreme humility and service and sacrifice and love also. So in other words, God's plan is to make us like a king and that's why the king of kings died for us, you know. But 
to be like a king means to be like Jesus. It means to be like Jesus. That's the goal. That's God's goal to make us like Christ in every way. And so today I want to take one aspect of that, becoming like Jesus the king. I want to just take one aspect and say that we must become like Jesus in the way we suffer. We must become like Jesus in the way we suffer. We've been looking at the cross from several vantage points, several perspectives. And this is one key perspective as well. Jesus' cross suffering is a model or an example for Christian suffering. Jesus' sufferings on the cross should be seen as a model, as an example for Christian suffering suffering Uh, this is an important theme in the gospel of mark not only in the bible but specifically in the gospel of mark this is an important theme and my goal is you know we're not trying to do a topical study on the cross or on the death of jesus rather we're trying to emphasize the themes that mark emphasizes and this is one such important theme that the cross must be seen as a model and an example for christian suffering jesus in other words is the type of king who is willing to suffer for a great cause and suffer to the extreme usually suffering and kingship are totally disassociated we think in our minds there's no connection The one who's hanging on a cross can't be a king, but that's exactly who he is. He's a different king. He's a different king. He's a king who's willing to suffer in an extreme way for an important cause. And he's a king who also handles suffering completely differently. The way he handles, the very willingness to suffer itself is different. Usually kings will only be willing to sit on the throne. He's willing to hang on a cross. But the way he does it is entirely different from the world. So God wants us to become like kings. You have to understand as God wants us to become like Jesus. God wants us to rule and reign in life. You have to understand it's Jesus type of ruling and reigning. And one aspect of that, one aspect of that is to be able to suffer like Jesus. (laughs) To become like Jesus also includes to be able to suffer like Jesus. Jesus. That's the truth for today and the next week. Jesus' sufferings on the cross is a model, example for Christian suffering. Jesus' cross suffering teaches us about Christian suffering. Now, several things may be coming up in your mind as I'm saying this. You may be wondering, oh, suffering? You know, that's, I don't think I'm interested in hearing this sermon. You know, this doesn't sound very appealing. Or, of course, it's, I, it's not that I want to preach this. It's not appealing to me either. <laughs> But you know, sometimes some things are hard, but uh, they're good for us. It's like some things are hard to eat, you know what I mean? That bitter spinach. Some of the kids don't like that. Most of the kids don't like that, you know? The broccoli or the, uh, or the more bitter spinach varieties, you know? Uh, but it's good for us. It's good to eat it, you know? Even though we don't like it, certain things, it's just good for us even though we may not like it. Now, I'm not suggesting that suffering is like the spinach. What I am suggesting is that biblical teaching about suffering is like the spinach. Not the suffering, but the biblical teaching regarding it is itself hard to hear, (laughs) hard to accept, but it's good for us. And that's why we have to do it. Another thing may crop up in your mind, which is, for people who always see the cross as something very great and Jesus accomplished and purchased blessings for us on the cross, something else may crop up in your mind. The thought that how can I say that Jesus' cross is a model for Christian suffering when actually Jesus suffered instead of us? Substitute as our substitute. You know, this is a very important idea. Probably the most important idea when it comes to the cross is that Jesus suffered as our substitute. That is the fundamental, central thing on which everything operates, basically. Without it, you cannot understand the cross. Jesus died as our substitute. Everybody say, Jesus died as my substitute. So, which means he died in my place. He died instead of me, which means he suffered instead of me. The whole idea is he suffered so that I don't have to suffer. Right? So how then can I say that his uh, cross 
is a model, is an example for how we should suffer. How can I say Jesus is our substitute and also say Jesus is our example? You know, Jesus' death is substitutionary, but Jesus' death is also exemplary in character. Can we say that? Because it sounds like they are uh, logically contradictory, but they are not. To our mind, it may seem contradictory, but if you look in the Bible, you will see that the Bible teaches both. The Bible teaches that Jesus died as our substitute, yes, but the Bible also teaches that his suffering and death should be seen as an example on how Christians should suffer. In what way did he die as my substitute? You see, he died in my place. It's true that he died in my place and therefore I don't have to suffer. In what way? I never have to suffer for my own sins. I will never have to suffer for my own sins. I will never have to earn my way to God, earn some merit. Now some even Christians have that kind of wrong idea. They attach a kind of a earning merit thing to suffering where the more you suffer, the more merit you earn with God and the better you get in his books, you know. He gives you a, something like that, you know. And that's the basis on which he accepts you. And that's the basis on which he looks down with favor upon you or something like that. In other words, the more you suffer, the more he accepts you or something like that. In other words, suffering is a way of earning your salvation. <laughs> Yeah, Jesus died for me, but I also kind of help out by suffering, you know, and adding to my merit points. No, 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 no. That is totally contradictory to the scriptures. Martin Luther really attacked that notion, you know, because when he was around, that's what they thought about suffering. They thought, you know, you've got to suffer and that adds to your merit with God and all that. Martin Luther said, no, you do not come to God based on anything you do. You rely purely on the righteousness he gives you. That's the only thing that qualifies you before God. No merit of your own, no good works of your own, not even suffering of your own. So I will never have to pay for my sins because Jesus paid the price for my sins. I don't have to experience God's wrath ever. I don't have to experience God's wrath ever because God's wrath was poured out upon Jesus. I will never be abandoned by God. <laughs> or let me put it like this. I will never have to cry, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me so that I should not cry like that Jesus cried <laughs> so that I should never be forsaken he was forsaken so that God should make his face to shine upon me Jesus experienced a certain God forsakenness where God turns his face away huh? so these are things that we will never have to suffer we will never have to pay the price for our sins because Jesus paid it we will never have to experience God's wrath because Jesus bore it we will never have to face abandonment by God because Jesus faced that on the cross and that is why even in the worst cases of persecution and martyrs dying you will notice like Stephen for example in the Acts chapter 7 right when he dies the way he dies is rather glorious, you know. He sees heavens opened. Jesus standing, you know, almost as if to welcome him. And he sees glorious Jesus. He dies with that vision of glory, with heavens open to him, waiting to receive him. Whereas you look at how Jesus died. He died crying out, my God, my God, why hast thou? You'll never see that in the martyrs. The martyrs always have a certain peace the martyrs always have a certain you know assurance that God is with them in the midst of their suffering and so on why so that the martyrs can die like this only Jesus died like that <laughs> Jesus was forsaken so that the martyrs will never be nobody even those dying for Jesus are never actually forsaken by God. You see, there are some things in Jesus' suffering that are absolutely unique. You cannot copy it. He's not a model in that way. <laughs> you know, he paid the price for my sins, so I go and pay the price. No, no, no. He's not a model in that way. He, you know, cried out, my God, my God, why is the first? So I cry out. No, he's not a model in that way, you know. There are some things unique about his suffering and there are some things that he bore which I will never have to bear. That's the greatest thing. That's true. And in that way, he died as my substitute. But, but, there is a but. 
if you read the Bible, you will see that in this fallen world, in this sinful world, as we live for Christ, it is inevitable that we will suffer for his name's sake. You see the, you understand that? Yes, he died as my substitute so that I will never have to suffer certain things. But in this fallen world, the more we live for Christ, it is inevitable in this sinful world, in this world ruled by the devil. That's what the Bible says, you know, he's the ruler of this world, he's the prince of the power of the air, he's the god of this world. Eh? According, to, those are all scriptural phrases. In this kind of world, when we live for Christ, it is inevitable that we will suffer for his name's sake. What does that mean? Well, when we live for Christ, we will face opposition. The devil is not going to be sitting there quietly as we live more for Christ, as we do great things, exploits for Christ. The world inspired by the devil is not going to sit quietly. They're going to come at us. They're going to come against us. And that produces a certain kind of conflict and suffering and all that, right? That is inevitable. That's what the Bible teaches. Yes, he died in my place as my substitute, but Christian suffering is inevitable because of the world we live in. And in that, Jesus becomes our model. Jesus' cross becomes our model. So there is no conflict. In our mind, maybe there is that logical conflict, but you know, our mind is just not up to the mark, let me say that. Our mind thinks that three persons and one God is... Uh, one being is contradictory. No, it's not. Our mind thinks that how can Jesus be fully God and fully man at the same time? But yeah, that's how it is. Our mind thinks how can God be sovereign and man free at the same time? Well, that's how it is. Get over it, you know. The more you grow as a Christian, the more you'll understand these things, the more you learn to accept these things. But just know that everything that seems like a contradiction in your mind is not. So Jesus died as my substitute as well because he died as my substitute, his death becomes uh, exemplary and it becomes a model and an example. I just want to show you one verse about this, how the Bible teaches both. The Bible teaches both that he died as my substitute for me, but also that his death, the way he died itself becomes an example that I need to follow. 1 Peter 2.21, 1 Peter 2.21, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you. Everybody say, for you. So for you means, the very meaning of for you means you don't have to suffer. Christ suffered for you, right? The point is you don't have to suffer. And then let's see what Peter follows that up with. Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example. Just combines both, just like that. As though there is no conflict, you know. Peter the fisherman, who some people say, who knows nothing, you know. He wasn't educated, they say. Oh, he's, he can't talk about great concepts. No, no, he's perfectly capable. He's a very wise person. He has the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. And then keep reading. What's the example? He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges. Can you see he's saying, look at Christ as your example. Look how he does not retaliate with violence. Look how he does not retaliate by reviling. They mocked him, but he didn't mock them back, you know. So look, the way he died is an example for us. Verse 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Now, again, now it's gone back to substitute. He bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds you have been healed again it's substitutionary because he was wounded I'm healed you know so Peter sees no problem in the fact that Jesus died as my substitute bore my sins bore wounds for my healing died for me but at the same time he left me an example he left me an example and his suffering becomes an example for me to follow when I suffer, you know. I have more passages. I won't read them because it'll take time, but I'll give them to you. All these passages, you will notice both these elements there. The idea of Jesus dying for us, substitute, so that we don't have to suffer, but also the idea that since that has happened, now it becomes an example in some way for us to follow so that his suffering becomes an example for how Christians suffer. Eh? Hebrews 13, 12 and 13, that's an example. Mark 10, 42 to 45, that's also an example. Uh, that's a 
passage like that. Eh? 1 John 4, 10 and 11, that's also a passage like that. Now, if you're interested, right, you can take all those passages and read them carefully. You'll find both ideas. Jesus died for me as my substitute in my place, so I don't have to. But since he did that, the whole thing about the way he did it becomes an example for me, a model for me to follow. And you can also see in all the passages that I just gave you, not only both are mentioned, there is a certain order. Substitute is mentioned first. The fact that he died for me is mentioned first. And then the fact that his death should somehow be taken as an example by me in how to suffer is mentioned second. Always. <laughs> there is an order to it. There is a priority to it, you know. <laughs> Which makes it clear that uh, his substitutionary death is only of utmost importance. The fact that he died as my substitute is number one. And if I accept that, then his death becomes an example for me to follow. The world will sometimes reject the idea of Jesus dying as my substitute. They will only grab on to this idea that, oh, let's follow the example of Jesus, you know. Oh, look at him on the cross as he forgives his enemies. Oh, look at how he cares for his mother. Oh, look at how he does not retaliate with violence. Oh, that's, you know, the example of Jesus. That's what is beautiful. That's what we should follow. You ask them, well, do you believe in the substitutionary death? They say, no, you know. As though they are following the example. <laughs> I find it very strange when the world says, oh, we love Jesus, you know, and his example, what a beautiful, like we should all follow his example. Are they following it? <laughs> Nobody can ever follow his example if they do not first accept him as their substitute. Unless you believe that he died for you. But see, people, for them, they got to let go of their ego. <laughs> To believe he died for me, I got to first admit that, well, I, you know, I'm a sinner. That's why he died for me. And I deserved a death. That's why he died for me. I'm that kind of a sinner. <laughs> Deserving death. I cannot save myself. Only way to save me is him. He has to die for me. It's too much for them to accept. And so they want to just embrace this idea of example. But Jesus' death as an example for us to follow in suffering is only for those who have already accepted him as their Lord and Savior and who believe that he's their substitute in death. Okay, so we are trying to cover both because both are biblically taught. For example, I've already covered the idea of substitute under things like Jesus bore my shame. Jesus bore our shame so that we can share in his glory. That's substitutionary. Eh? Jesus took our shame eh? in our place so that we might share his, take his glory, you know, we receive his glory in his place. Eh? Share in his glory, better put. So, we will continue to speak about the substitutionary aspect when we hit verses like 33 to verse 38, which is really the climax of the death episode, you know, where Jesus dies. It reaches that high point where the darkness fills the earth. He cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Breathes his last. Temple veil is torn into two. When I hit that, I will talk about his substitutionary death again because that's the heart of the cross. But today and next week, I'm trying to address this aspect that Jesus is our example in how to suffer. Jesus' cross teaches us about Christian suffering. So today and next week, today what we're going to see is Jesus' cross sufferings shows us that there is suffering for Christians. There, biblically, the Bible teaching is, if you just look at the cross, just look at the cross and the teachings related to that, you will realize that there is some suffering for a Christian. <laughs> okay? I'll show you that. Secondly, when you look at the cross and the teachings associated with it, the cross clarifies what kind of suffering we are called to suffer. So, first of all, we're going to see how Jesus' cross shows us that there is suffering for a Christian. In fact, we are called to a certain kind of suffering. Secondly, we're going to see how Jesus' cross suffering clarifies the kind of suffering we are called to. Eh? There is suffering. What kind of suffering for a Christian? There is something we can call as Christian suffering, but what kind of suffering is it? Okay, so firstly, if you just keep looking at the cross, I think you can't help but think at a certain point. I don't see how you can never think about this aspect. 
If you just keep on looking at the cross, keep on thinking about the cross, at some stage you will have the thought, I think, that my goodness, if Jesus who lived so perfectly, who did the will of God, who lived the most perfect stellar life, if he went and suffered like this, then nobody can be exempt from suffering. I feel like that thought almost will arise naturally if you just spend enough time thinking about the cross. If you realize that if you follow Jesus from his earthly life, beginning his ministry and all the stuff he did, oh, you know, all the good things he did. Every day he got up and he served people. Every day he got up and he did the will of God. He did not commit one sin. He did all righteousness, fulfilled all righteousness. And every day he lived for God. He lived for people. And then he goes and dies on the cross. He ends up on a cross, you know. The more you process that, I feel like at a certain point you can't help but think, my goodness, if he ended up on a cross, then really nobody's exempt from suffering. Nobody can be exempt from suffering. Now, whether or not you had the thought, just looking at the cross is irrelevant because Jesus' teachings make it very plain to us. Maybe you didn't have the thought crop up like I said by thinking about the cross. But if you paid attention to Jesus' teachings and then looked at the cross, he makes the connection. If you look at the cross plus Jesus' teachings, it's absolutely clear that if he suffered, then surely suffering is for other Christians as well. Eh? Look at Mark 8.34. Now, don't jump to conclusions in your mind about what kind of suffering I'm talking about because I'll clarify that. That's the second point of the sermon, okay? At this stage, we're only saying that the cross shows that uh, Christians will have suffering. <laughs> simple. If Jesus suffered, we will suffer. That's all. It's a very simple point, eh? which Jesus himself teaches, Mark 8.34. When he had called the people, simple uh, logically, but <laughs> hard to accept, you know, practically. Now, remember the context of uh, Mark 8.34. Mark 8.31 is a very important verse in Mark because it is the turning point where Jesus starts heading to the cross. You know, Jesus who had focused on teaching and preaching and healing and uh, driving out demons and, uh, and all that stuff, at Mark 8.31 in Caesarea Philippi, when Peter confesses him as the Messiah, for the first time, he openly, plainly tells his disciples, I got to go suffer and die and then rise again. For the first time, he tells his disciples openly, plainly. That's Mark 8.31. And Peter cannot digest it. He says, a king, go and die? What do you mean? Messiah, go and die on a cross? Go and suffer? Ludicrous. Which king will go and die like that? Which Messiah will go suffer like that? No chance. It can never happen to you. Jesus basically tells Peter to shut up. He says, you don't know what you're talking about. Get thee behind me, Satan. You do not know the things of God. Eh? You think in a worldly way is what Jesus told Peter. And Jesus could have left it just like that. Instead, what he does is, in Mark 8.34, he then calls everybody, calling the crowd to him with his disciples. He makes a scene. You know, he calls everybody and he makes a big lesson out of it. And look what he says. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. It's very extreme it is. <laughs> Peter was not even willing to accept the notion that Jesus had to suffer. <laughs> Go to a cross. <laughs> that itself was too much to Peter. Jesus is basically saying, if you can't even accept that I have to go to a cross, let me tell you something more. There is a cross for you. Cross is not only for me, but there is a cross also for you. Whoever wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. The picture is this, you know, Jesus is turning from Caesarea Philippi, which is up way up north, far away from Jerusalem, and he's going to come down south to Jerusalem. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to die on a cross. And if you want to follow me, you take up your cross and follow me. What does that mean? You know what he's saying? I'm going to die. You want to follow me? You come ready to die. That's what he's saying. I'm going to die. You want to follow me? You come ready to die. Now people take that, take up your cross and follow Jesus very lightly today. It's become very, because today's the day we hang crosses on our necks, right? We, people say, you know, well, my cross is 
maybe some, you know, I lost my job, that's become my cross, you know, my child, you know, rebelled, that's my cross. No, I want to ask you, think, put yourself in the shoes of somebody 2,000 years ago in Rome, taking up your cross and going means one thing. The one who took up a cross and walked was going to his death. That's what it meant. What Jesus was saying is nothing less than, you want to follow me? Come ready to die for me if necessary. Come ready to die for me if necessary. Come ready to give up anything for me if necessary. It's extreme. It's harsh. I preached on it. You know, you can go listen to it. But Jesus, of course, gives us reasons to still follow him. You know, in the next verse, 35, verse 35. In case some people want to cop out and say, my goodness, who wants to follow this Jesus, you know? Go ready to die. Who wants to live that kind of life? Jesus says in verse 35, for whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Can you see what he's saying? He's saying, well, if you think, okay, I don't want this kind of life. You follow Jesus, you got to be ready to die. You got to be ready to give up this and that. Who wants this life? Jesus is telling to all the people who think like that, well, think again, think carefully. If you say no to me and you go the other way, you will surely die. <laughs> Not only now, you'll die eternally. You will run into failure in this life and failure in eternity. Verse 35 says, if you try to save your life, you'll end up losing it. If you're ready to give up your life for me, you'll end up saving it. It's a paradox, you know. So Jesus is saying, basically, you know, I'm all there is. <laughs> the other way leads to destruction. My way leads to life, but you got to come ready to die. You know. So the basic idea I want to communicate to you is Jesus is saying, the cross is not just for me. It's in some way for you also. In some way it's for you also. And John 15, 18 to 20. John 15, 18 to 20. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Eh? Basically, the idea Jesus is teaching is, listen, if I suffered, you also will suffer. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. It's very simple. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If the world persecuted Jesus, they will also persecute his followers. Matthew 10, 24. Matthew 10, 24. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. Who's the teacher? Jesus. Disciple is, are his followers. You know, Jesus is saying, listen, you're not above me. We're not above Jesus. It's enough if we are like Jesus. And then look what he says. If they have called the master of the house Belzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? If they refer to Jesus as Belzebul, which is the prince of demons. You know, it's like basically calling Jesus the devil. It's almost like that. It is like that. You know, they said, you know what the Jewish religious leaders said? They said that Jesus is casting out demons through demonic spirit, through Beelzebul, <laughs> through the prince of demons. Basically saying that like something like Jesus is, you know, I feel uncomfortable even saying it. They're blaspheming basically. Jesus is saying, if they slandered me to this extent, called me basically the devil, then surely they're going to do the same too. You. If they spoke so evil about me, they're going to speak evil about you. There's nothing to be surprised. The kinds of sufferings I experienced, you also will experience in some way, not to the same degree, but you know, to a lesser degree, but in some way, shape, or form. Mark 13, 9 to 13, also Jesus talks about the suffering they will experience, and it looks very much like what he went through, you know, just to a lesser degree, you know. So the basic idea is Jesus taught very clearly that if he was going to suffer on the cross, uh, mockery and shame and pain and, and rejection and all these things, they also will suffer. There's no surprise. If Christ was persecuted, his followers also would be persecuted. Eh? The rest of the New Testament also confirms this, 2 Timothy 3.12. All who 
want to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. All who, 2 Timothy 3.12, all who want to live godly in Christ Jesus, eh, all, everybody say all, <laughs> not the whole world, but all who want to live godly will suffer persecution in some way, shape or form to some degree, you know. Acts 14.22, the end of that verse also says that. I'll read 1 Peter 4.12, 1 Peter 4.12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. He's talking about persecution coming to Christians, you know. Don't be surprised when persecution comes like a fiery trial. Don't be, sub nothing to be surprised. Jesus started, Jesus suffered it. We also will suffer it in some shape, to some degree. In fact, Peter says in uh, 1 Peter 2.21 that we have been called to this kind of suffering. This is very strange language. Called to this kind of suffering. 1 Peter 2.21. Look at 1 Peter 2.21. Uh, for to this you have been called. Now, what is the this? For to this means what? Read the previous verse. What credit is it when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? He's saying... What credit do you get if you do something wrong and they beat you and you say, well, I'm enduring? What's the point of that? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. So Peter is saying, don't be doing bad and then suffering comes and then you're saying, oh, I'm enduring suffering. No, no. Do good. And then when suffering comes, you endure it. When you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called. Everybody say called. <laughs> to what you have been called? You have been called to live a life of doing good. And while you are doing good, this evil world, inspired by an evil devil, may oppose you, may persecute you. And when that happens, when you endure... That's a gracious thing. You have been called to this kind of life. A life of doing good which may end up in <laughs> suffering, persecution. Huh? Which may have to go through persecution. Philippians 1.29. Huh? You've been called. The idea that you've been called to this. Huh? A Christian is called to this kind of life. To do good and be willing to face persecution for doing good. <laughs> Huh? Philippians 1.29 It has been granted to you Everybody say granted to you Very strange Peter says you've been called to this Paul says it has been granted to you The word granted means graciously given to you eh? It has been granted to you That for the sake of Christ You should not only believe in him But also suffer for his sake <laughs> What has been granted to you To believe in Christ But to also to Suffer for his sake. So there is something, there is some suffering to which the Christian is called and it is granted to us to suffer for his sake and so on. What kind of suffering is this? So first I've shown you enough sufficient evidence from the scriptures that a Christian is called to some kind of suffering. And Jesus' cross shows it. If he suffered, we suffer. And Secondly, what kind of suffering are we called to suffer? This is a very important thing. What kind of suffering are we called to suffer? Because this is where people go wrong sometimes. Eh? What kind of suffering are we called to suffer? Let me clarify first, saying what it's not. What kind of suffering we are not called to suffer? We are not called to suffer anything that is a result of our own mistakes or sins. We are not called to suffer anything that's a result of our own Mistakes. Now let's be honest, most of the things that we suffer probably are a result of our own <laughs> whatever. Sin, foolishness, ignorance, unbelief, impatience, you can add, keep adding the list. You know. The people of Israel were carried off into exile as a result of their own sin. That was not a suffering they were called to suffer, go off into exile, you know, no. <laughs> God warned them time and again, they refused to listen, they rebelled. They faced the consequences. They ended up in exile. The student who thinks he's very smart, not studying at all for the exam the whole year, and then the day before, he thinks that's the wise thing to do, you know. <laughs> day before you study and you go and pass. Well, actually, it's a foolish thing. And due to their foolishness, sometimes 
you know, they suffer things. Maybe they did not get enough marks or failed or did not get enough marks to get into a good college, to open up, you know, good career opportunities, whatever. And so the sufferings, they result or the problems that come as a result are a result of their own foolishness, laziness, sometimes ignorance. My people perish for lack of knowledge, God said. Probably the biggest reason is simply we are ignorant. Just because of ignorance, we suffer things that we don't really have to. Or unbelief, the people of Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. You know, and people, Christians looking at that today say, we are, God has called us to the wilderness life. You know, God never called anybody to the wilderness life. He called them out of Egypt to take them into the promised land via the wilderness, through the wilderness. They remained in the wilderness due to their unbelief. And that was a suffering they endured because of their own sin. It was their unbelief. Unbelief is also a cause for our own, some of our own failures today. I mean, my failures, your failures, whatever, right? So, but that's, you see, that's not the kind of suffering we're called to. In fact, that's the kind of suffering we should avoid. <laughs> we should not be ignorant. We should fill our mind with the knowledge of God's word. We should receive God's wisdom and act accordingly. We should, you know, hear the word of God. So faith rises up in our heart. Yeah? We should live a life of righteousness. These are things that God actually tells us to avoid, wants us to avoid, not calls us to suffer. Jesus did not suffer for his own sin. You know what I mean. Now, in case you're sitting here, because all of us have done things for which we suffer. That's the truth, including me. In case you're sitting here, let me just tell you, even if you've done something wrong, you know, even this kind of suffering, a Christian can handle it much better. A Christian can face it much better and overcome it on an entirely higher level. Even if you have messed up your own life by your own mistakes, <laughs> even if you are the reason for your life becoming what it is today and you regret it and you're filled with regret and guilt and all that, you know, you have something that the world does not have. You have Jesus. If you come to him and if you confess your sin or whatever, he will forgive you. Not only that, he will redeem the consequence of your sin itself. You know that? He will redeem. What, is the, what does it mean to redeem the consequence? That means whatever bad result came as a result of your own sin or foolishness or whatever, God is able to turn it for good. It may not all disappear, but God will turn at least turn it for good. <laughs> so that... You don't have to just be living with the regret saying, well, you know, I messed up and that's why my life is like this. No, no. A Christian can face any kind of suffering on a different level, you know. Even if we've messed up our own life, we can receive forgiveness and our life can be redeemed, restored in God's own way. Yeah? All you got to do is come in. But that's not the kind of suffering we're called to. You know what I mean. Secondly, another kind of suffering we're not called to. Suffering that is a result of living in this fallen, sinful messed up world. Not all suffering is a result of our own mistakes. Some things just happen because we live in this messed up fallen world. You know that song we sing, Is He Worthy? The first line is, do you feel the world is broken? And the people answer, yes, we do. The world is broken. The world is messed up. And that's why there was a pandemic, for example. COVID did not come only to the worst sinners in the world. It came to anybody. It came to you know, people who are sinners and those who are righteous who live a pretty good life and live a messed up life. It came to anybody. You know? We don't think of it like that. The pandemic affected the whole world because there is sickness in this world because it's a fallen world. It's a messed up world. That's why there are you know, natural disasters and so on. And another example would be natural aging. You know? Aging, right? People get old. Are we going to say only sinners get old? You know? No, everybody gets old. You know what I mean? It's not uh, that the ones who sin a lot get older. You know, No, it's a natural thing. In this fallen world, the moment you're born, one thing is certain, you're going to die one day. <laughs> your death is a certainty at your birth itself. And then you get older. And the older people get, sometimes they get weaker. The body gets weaker. They can't do the things they used to do before. The really old people, sometimes they struggle. They suffer, you know. It's not because they sinned or something. It's been a messed up world. Death is something we face because this is a messed up world. It's, that's not the suffering we are called to suffer. 
No, that's not Christian suffering. You know what I mean? That's not Christian suffering. That's, everybody suffers that. Everybody went through the pandemic. Everybody's going to die one day unless Jesus returns uh, before that. Everybody goes through aging. That's not the suffering we're called to. But even that suffering, let me say, you know, like another example would be recession in the economy. If there's recession in the economy and as a result of that, we, people lose their jobs. Let's say even Christians lose their jobs. That's not a suffering that a Christian can claim. Well, that's Christian suffering. No, that's not Christian suffering. Everybody's, a lot of people are losing their jobs. A lot of people are losing their jobs and the Christian also is losing their job maybe. The Christian cannot claim that he's suffering, you know, for Christ or whatever. No, no. That's a result of this suffering that comes from a messed up fallen world. But I say to you, even again, the principle applies that suffering of any kind can be handled and overcome on an entirely different level as a Christian. If you are believing in Christ, you know, whether the economy is down or up, Christ is on the throne. Jesus rules and reigns. You go to him and you say, you know, Jesus, I believe you are above all this. Whether even everybody can be losing their jobs, but I believe you will get me a job. You are able to do that. You are able to open doors that, you know, no man can fathom. And so you do something for me, Lord. You are king. You are Lord. You rule. You reign. I'm in your kingdom. You see, we have that option. The world does not. I, I think of the time, the COVID time, you know, I, I, I used to think sometimes how people in the world would have suffered during the pandemic, during the early stages when people were just, you know, instilling people with fear and so on. How they would have overcome the fear. They don't have a God they know as a father. Like we do. We can go any time to him. Receive mercy and grace to help in time of need. So we can face all this suffering on a different level. But let me clarify. That's not the kind of suffering we are called to suffer. You don't need a calling for that. You just need to be born in this world. Messed up world. To suffer these things. <laughs> but as a Christian we are called to suffer a certain suffering. What is that? Let me say positively now. What is Christian suffering? What is this suffering that is unique to a Christian that nobody else really suffers? Christian suffering is suffering for God's sake or Christ's sake. The way I told you what it's not. Now I'm going to tell you what it is. The cross of Jesus, Jesus' cross clarifies what it is. Jesus' cross clarifies the kind of suffering we are called to suffer. It is suffering for God's sake. Look at Jesus. He did not suffer because he was disobedient to God. Actually, he was obedient. Very interesting because Adam suffered because he was disobedient. Adam brought the curse upon himself because he disobeyed God and dishonored God. And that's why the curse fell on his head, you know, and on mankind. Look at Jesus. He did not suffer because he disobeyed and dishonored God. In fact, he suffered... On the path of obeying and honoring God. In fact, you know, he suffered because he said, not my will but yours be done. If he had reversed it and said, not your will but mine be done, he could have avoided the cross, you know. Because he said, no, no matter what comes, your will be done. And gave him some hundred percent to the will of God, he suffered the most. It's very different. It's very different. That's why the cross changes your perspective on everything. On everything. He didn't suffer because he was disobedient. He suffered because he was obedient. <laughs> he suffered on the path of maximum obedience. Faithfully following God. That's the kind of suffering we are called to. <laughs> suffering for God, suffering for Christ. So, so I want to put it first. He suffered for God. He, he suffered for God's sake. He suffered because he did the will of God. He suffered, you know, because he went where God told him to go. <laughs> did what God told him to do, you know. And that's the kind of suffering we are called to suffer. We suffer for Christ's sake. We suffer for Christ's sake. Everybody say Christ's sake. In Mark 8, 35, Jesus actually says that. He says that for my sake or for the gospel's sake, he says. But let me read Matthew 5 because I've already covered that. Matthew 5 verse 11. Eh? Matthew 5 verse 11. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. 
Huh? On my account means for my sake. <laughs> for my, Jesus is saying, blessed are you. This is the Beatitudes. He begins with the blessed, you know, the blessed. He says, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you. Huh? Revile you means like mock you, you know, humiliate you, persecute you, utter all kinds of evils against you falsely for my sake. Everybody say for my sake, you know. That is Christ's sake. Jesus is saying, if you suffer for my sake, you are blessed. Huh? This kind of suffering for Christ's sake could manifest in various ways, on various levels. You know, it could uh, sometimes for some people it has ended up in death. In the last 20 centuries, 2000 years since Christ rose again and ascended, there have been so many martyrs. <laughs> I don't remember the count, but it's crazy. Sometimes we think only in the early church period people died as martyrs, you know. You know what it means to die as a martyr, right? It means basically you're given the choice to deny Jesus or die. Give up Jesus or give up your life. That's the choice given to what we call a martyr, you know. And that person, the person who's a martyr says, I will not deny Jesus. I will choose death over denying Jesus. And they die for Jesus, for the sake of Jesus. That's what a martyr is. A Christian martyr is one who dies for Jesus. Meaning, who dies instead of denying Jesus. From Stephen's death in Acts 7 to today, there have been so many martyrs. In fact, they say that uh, more have died for Christ in the 20th century than in the previous 19 centuries combined. Just think about that. Because the world population has increased. Even though persecution was at a very high level in the early church, actually, if you take the count, more have died in the last century, the 20th century, than in the first 19 centuries combined. But it, not always does it end up in death. Even today people die for Christ. Sometimes it is a lesser form. Like people humiliate you. People mock you. In fact, that's the kind of suffering Jesus mentions in verse 11 here. Blessed are you when others revile you. Utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. For my sake. Eh? Speak lies about you. Sometimes just because we're following Jesus and we're preaching Jesus and we're doing the work of Jesus, people speak evil against us. People speak lies against us. People slander us. People insult us. People mock us. Jesus says, well, blessed are you. You know, <laughs> Blessed are you when that happens. <laughs> it happened to me. It happened to you. Eh? Don't be surprised. But then look, he says, verse 12, rejoice and be glad. Everybody say rejoice. <laughs> what? Rejoice? Eh? It's all upside down, isn't it? <laughs> we want to cry. Jesus says, blessed are you. We want to, you know, go into our shell of self-pity. Jesus says, blessed are you. <laughs> if you are experiencing persecution for Jesus' sake, blessed, you are blessed. In fact, you ought to rejoice, Jesus says. Rejoice and be glad. Why? Yeah. Is Jesus some kind of sadist, you know, who says, yeah, just be happy in the midst of the pain? No. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. Why should we rejoice and be glad? Because the more they persecute us, the greater our reward will be in heaven. The more they persecute us, the greater our reward will be in Heaven. In fact, in another place, in Mark 10, Jesus says, if you give up anything for me, I will compensate in this life and in the next life for you. So by the way, everybody's not going to get the same rewards in heaven. You know what I mean? I'm sorry, it's not going to happen like that. It's going to be different rewards. And certainly the persecuted ones will receive more reward. That's what Jesus says. Your reward is great in heaven when people persecute you for Jesus' sake. Mark 10, 28, look what Jesus says to Peter, right? We've seen all this, but a reminder now would be good. You know, Peter says in verse 28 that um, we left everything to follow you, remember? And then Jesus said, well, if anyone gives up houses and lands and mothers and fathers and you know, family members for my sake, I will return hundredfold in this life with persecution. Do you see that? 
Mark 10, 28, 29, 30. Peter is saying, oh, we gave up everything to follow you. What are we getting? Jesus said, whatever you gave up, whether it's by way of wealth or family, connections, relationships, I will return to you hundredfold in this life. Hundredfold means what? He repeats, if you read that verse, he repeats houses, lands, family members, relationships. I will compensate. In some way, I will compensate to you hundred times in this life, but it will be with persecution. It'll be with what? See, that's the idea that the Bible teaches. The Bible is not an unrealistic book where it says, you know, you come and Jesus will just bless you and life will be a bed of roses, you know. No, Jesus tells very openly, you come, sometimes you have to give up things for my sake, but whatever you give up, I'll compensate hundred times, but it'll be with persecution. Why? Because when God blesses you a hundred times, guarantee some fellows are going to be a hundred times more jealous. And hundred times they're going to hate you more. Yeah, you think as God blesses you hundred times more, everybody's going to sit there and applaud. Wow, no, no, everybody's not going to. (laughs) Some will be jealous, some will hate, some will slander. (laughs) That's the way this life is, you know. This is not God's fault. This is an indictment of the world and it's sin and it's evil. So, blessed are you. Everybody say, blessed are you. Everybody say, rejoice. Be glad. For your reward is great, Eh? both in earth as well as in heaven. God will make it up to you. eh? But there is a suffering that we might encounter that is for Christ's sake, for Christ's sake. So I talked about mocking, humiliation. Sometimes it could be pain. You know, Jesus was beaten physically. Paul was beaten five times. That Jewish flogging left for dead ones. Just think about his back. My goodness. You know, sometimes it's the loss of friends, uh, comfort, family. Some people are persecuted in the family. You know, some families, they ostracize. They just cut off their relationship with some family member just because they became a believer It's happened to some people. Eh? Maybe at work, you're persecuted. Even within the visible church, people are persecuted. Like John Wesley, you know, always in throughout church history, always the people inside only persecute first. (laughs) The apostles were first persecuted by the insiders, not the outsiders. Martin Luther was persecuted by the church, the formal church. John Wesley was banned from preaching in any of the churches in England. They banned him. He said, you cannot preach in any church. One of the greatest preachers who ever lived. Because he was preaching against dead religion, you know, and hypocrisy and all that. And so he went out to the streets and the fields. And they said, no, you can't preach in the fields also. Because the fields are part of our parish, you know. They divided themselves into parishes. The whole country was Christian, England, and divided into parishes, districts. And each parish, each district had its own kind of church and... and, uh, So basically they were saying, don't come into our territory. You can't come into our church. Don't even enter this district, you know. Finally, John Wesley said, am I to obey you or God? You know, God told me to go preach. The world is my parish, he said. (laughs) Who cares about what you say? The world is my, I'll preach in the fields. I'll preach in all your districts. (laughs) I will disobey your law if I have to, to obey God's law. (laughs) And that's when he uttered the famous line, the world is my parish. So, but imagine what he would have gone through when every church banned him from entering it. Just imagine, I mean, he has a preacher, he can't even enter one church, you know. Imagine the, the humiliation or whatever, you know. But this is how it's always been. And uh, Jesus is saying in Mark 8, 34, whoever wants to follow me, count the cost, you know. See if I'm worth it. <laughs> Don't have any rosy ideas, <laughs> If you're following me, be ready to give up anything. If you're following me, be ready to give up anything. The second thing I wanted to say is, if Christian suffering is for Christ's sake, everybody say for Christ's sake, you have to always ask that question, am I suffering for Christ's sake or no? You know. So for Christ's sake, secondly, Christian suffering is not because you've done wrong, but because you've done right. <laughs> or Maybe because it's too strong of a word. It's not because you've done wrong, but you're suffering even though you're doing right. Not because you've done wrong, but even though you're doing right, you're suffering. 
Jesus suffered like that. He did no wrong. He lived perfectly. They accused him falsely and put him on the cross. Not because of any wrong he did, but because he lived too perfect, you know. What was the great fault he did? He lived too perfect. <laughs> he lived so righteous that he put to shame the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, who everybody thought was righteous until Jesus came around. But Jesus basically, by his true righteousness, <laughs> when the light turns bright, you can see all the dirty spots. You know what I mean? It's like that. When Jesus appeared on the scene, he was so perfect. Next to him, these fellows looked like hypocrites, which they were. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. And so they hated him for it. What reason? He was too perfect. They were jealous. They hated. That's the kind of suffering we are called to. 1 Peter 2 21. Eh? Or if you're in Matthew, verse 10 itself points that out. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Everybody say, for righteousness' sake. Not for sin's sake. Not for evil's sake. Not persecuted because you're doing wrong or sin. No, no. For righteousness' sake. If you're persecuted for righteousness' sake, blessed are you. Great is your reward in heaven. 1 Peter 2 20. What credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? We read this already, right? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Eh? When you do good and suffer, eh? everybody say, do good and suffer. <laughs> That's the suffering we're called to. <laughs> you do good and you face suffering if you have to. You know? You do good even at the prospect of suffering. Even if you know it'll, it may end up in suffering. Eh? This is Christian suffering, you know. You do good and yet you suffer. <laughs> and the world thinks, if somebody is suffering, they must have done something wrong. You know, you know that's how the world thinks, right? If they see somebody in uh, suffering, like in pain or shame or experiencing this or that, going through a tough time, you know, losing this and that, automatically a lot of people think in their mind, they may not say it out loud, but they think, he must have done something to deserve it. <laughs> must have done something to deserve it. And some people think, Maybe in this life, maybe in the previous incarnation, you know. <laughs> Somewhere, something must have happened. That's why he is. You see, the cross breaks that notion. Because what you see on the cross is the one who suffered the most. And he did nothing to deserve it. Nothing. You see, the cross has to turn your thinking upside down. You see the one hanging there suffering the most, but he did nothing to deserve it. Just because somebody is suffering does not mean they must have done something to deserve it. If nothing else can change our mind about that, the cross ought to. There are many instances in the Bible of that kind of, the concept of the righteous sufferer. The righteous one who is yet suffering, you know. But it's seen in its greatest display on the cross. So the world looks at somebody being mocked and humiliated and they think, he must have done something. <laughs> Nobody was humiliated more than Jesus. He did nothing wrong. The world looks at people who don't suffer and say, well, they must have done something good to deserve this life, you know. And the ones who are suffering, well, they must have done something bad to deserve this life. The cross turns that upside down. No, 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 no. Christians are called to suffer like Jesus in the sense that we are called to a life of transformation where we do good, we show love and all that but then sometimes forces in the world inspired by the devil are against us. They give us trouble, they mock us, humiliate us. That's the way it is. <laughs> no surprise. If we are surprised, we are the ones who are totally mentally unprepared. That's what it shows. If we are surprised when the world opposes us, when we are persecuted for righteousness sake, then that means we know nothing. We are totally ignorant of the Bible teaching regarding this. The Bible tells us very clearly this is how it will be. If they persecuted Jesus, they will persecute you. The world thinks bad things cannot happen to good people. 
cross says the worst happened to the best person throws out all that kind of stuff you know let me point out one thing in peter couple of things and close here one is that i want to point out that word here verse 20 if you endure this kind of suffering this is a gracious thing in the sight of god did you see that this is a gracious thing eh? verse 20 the end of it this is a gracious thing in the sight of god verse 19 also says that verse 19 beginning this is a gracious thing when mindful of god one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly everybody say suffering unjustly that means you should not suffer but you're suffering <laughs> it's a gracious thing everybody say it's a gracious thing in god's sight that means when god sees it he doesn't see it like the world ah oh, you're suffering you must have done something wrong no when you live for him and yet suffer god sees this as a gracious thing there is something noble about a person who is suffering for christ's sake who is not suffering for what he did wrong but what he did right <laughs> there is something noble when you see jesus there having given himself 100% to the will of god every ounce of his existence he gave to god and said i'll do whatever you do go wherever you tell me i'll go to the cross also there's something very noble about that when a person surrenders completely to god despite whatever the cost is there is something noble when that person is hanging there and yet he has done nothing wrong hope you can see that it's a gracious thing in the sight of god there is a glory to the suffering of jesus because he is suffering for doing the will of god and he is suffering even though he was absolutely perfect sinless that is glorious that is glorious that's why i talked about the glory behind the shame there's a certain glory to the cross if you don't see that then you will not be able to see how christian suffering appears gracious in the sight of god eh? what do you see there when you see jesus hanging on the cross There's many things you got to see one of the things you got to see somebody totally given over to the will of God and somebody who is suffering for no wrong he did that's the kind of suffering christians are called to suffer because there is something glorious about that and you know what that kind of suffering will glorify god that kind of suffering will glorify god we can't understand everything about suffering but but we should understand this all things in the end will be turned to the glory of god and even the suffering of his people will end up glorifying him especially when you're persecuted you know thank god we are not persecuted but some people may be and when we are persecuted and we are ready to give up anything for christ's sake you know first of all we have to be mentally ready for something like that we have to think about that we we have to count the cost and all that we have to really you know ask ourselves is jesus that valuable because <laughs> only if jesus is more valuable than the rest of the world put together you will be willing to give up anything for him is he that valuable to you <laughs> he is that valuable question is do you know his value do you really think he's worth giving up anything he's is worth giving up anything for you know if it comes to a choice you are you will be ready to give up anything for him you know do you regard him as such as such a great treasure in with such great value do you look upon him like that he's more you know like jesus says in one place if anyone loves father or mother or wife or children more than me is not worthy of me I mean, that's a daring statement anybody else makes that statement we would say how arrogant you know he says anyone loves anyone more than me they're not worthy of me that means he's saying i you know i'm more worthy than all your other relationships your relationship with me is more special more valuable than anything else the whole world on one side and jesus on one side jesus is more valuable but the thing is do we understand that does our heart accept that you know if we are put in that kind of situation and if it comes to the choice of well will you deny jesus or give up this and if we are willing to give up precious things in life that really glorifies jesus doesn't it it really glorifies jesus it's one thing to say you know oh jesus you're my everything you know jesus you're my number one but it's another thing to actually live it out <laughs> to show that uh, 
Jesus, you're worth having more than all this. Even if everything else is taken, if I have you, I have everything. To actually live it out shows the greatness, the glory, the treasure that Jesus is. When we sing, we only glorify God to a certain extent. <laughs> when we live out what we sing, we glorify God on a different level. See, my prayer is that, you know, I hope none of us have to go through this kind of persecution. You know what I mean? I, I don't like this any, any more than you do. <laughs> but we have to be real. We have to be realistic and not be living up in the clouds. You know, we're not in heaven already. We're on earth. We're in this world. And if you really live for Jesus... <laughs> There's a very good chance we may face this kind of persecution from the world. And are you mentally ready for something like this? Uh, start thinking about it and, and, you know, ask how valuable is Jesus to me really, you know. And may God show you that he is more valuable than this whole world put together. And may God lead us to glorify him in our days of blessing as well as in our moments of suffering for Christ. Let's all stand up. Next week, we'll continue and talk about how he faced it, you know, the manner in which he faced it, and that it's a model for us, and, and how we can be transformed more and more to be like him. It's a very countercultural thing. It's a very counter-world thing. <laughs> really, we need God's help. We need God's help to think in a new way, to accept this kind of uh, teaching, to accept this reality. It's not easy. Father God, we come to you in Jesus' name. We pray that you will help us. Help our minds to comprehend, Lord, these things. that are difficult to understand and even more difficult to accept and live out and all that. But Father, you, in your great wisdom, have worked out things this way. And so we know that it is all for good. It is all in the end for our good and for your glory. We know, Lord, that when we stand for you in this world, in the midst of persecution, we will glorify your name on another level. So we ask that you will give us the courage, your kind of courage, to stand and to face whatever come, come what may, to be faithful to you, to live for you, knowing that in the end, it is your way that is the best way. Even if we lose anything, you compensate. And you have glory beyond the suffering waiting for us. You have reward beyond the suffering waiting for us. And the opposite path would lead to a much worse destruction. Help us, Lord, to fathom these things and put it in proper perspective and truly count the cost. And come to the right decision that you are worthy of our life itself. Of our utmost devotion and sacrifice. And help us Lord to follow you and glorify you more and more. Continue to cause us to experience your blessings. And glorify yourself through us in that way as well. To you be all the glory, honor and praise. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us for now and forevermore. Amen.